I just want her to know that I don't care about the scars. I stick a razor in my mouth and do this to myself. And you know what? She can't stand the sight of me. Now I see the funny side. Now I'm always smiling. Ooh, in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, this is the most chilling moment. Heath Ledger's Joker alters his backstory, signaling to us that he is truly a wild card in the vein of Alan Moore's The Killing Joke. To this day, we do not know who he is or where he came from, and essential to that mystery, I just realized, is Ledger's makeup. It's a living painting that hints at an untold story about this Joker's supposed madness. And I promise you, there is one specific detail hidden in the Joker's makeup in this shot that'll make this analysis worth the watch. I'm Eric Voss, and this is The Deep Dive, a channel that dives deep into the films we love to reveal new details that we both deserve and need right now. The Dark Knight remains the best superhero film adaptation of all time, and one of the all-time biggest summer game changers. And despite talking about it on the main New Rockstars channel before, five years later, and three other live-action movie jokers later, I had to revisit The Dark Knight with an even deeper dive, because every rewatch unearths new details, and I believe that hiding in plain sight on the Joker's face lies the truth of his origin. Here we go. The film opens with the Batman logo emblazoned in fire. All three of Nolan's Batman movies open with the Batman sigil formed by the elements to frame the hero's coming trials in that movie. Batman begins with swarming bats to show Bruce's embracing of his fear of bats. The Dark Knight Rises with cracking ice to show Bruce breaking through Bane's frozen over Gotham. Here, Fire is the Joker's tool. He burns cars and hospitals, half of Harvey Dent's face. He loves gasoline and gunpowder. His whole message is, everything burns. Which is why Alfred's solution is to fight fire with fire. We burn the forest down. And by the way, that solution is actually a callback to Batman Begins when Ra's al Ghul says, when the forest grows too wild, a purging fire is inevitable and natural. We start with Gotham City, using the Chicago skyline, as Nolan wanted Gotham to be the principal character of this movie, with multiple tiers and dimensions, the Chicago skyline, the elevated train, the street level, the streets like Lower Wacker Drive. Nolan's Gotham is a microcosm of human society as a whole, and this pristine facade is marred by a window shattering. And yeah, you can see Nolan's helicopter reflecting in the windows. But it is a beautiful sunny day. This isn't when crime happens in Batman movies, but that is the point. Gotham is a normal looking American city about to explode. The Joker stands in broad freaking daylight on the street corner. No one bats an eye. And Nolan shows him only from behind, focusing on his mask. I love these masks. Each member of this heist has their own unique clown mask. Customer Lindy Hemming said that the gang would have gotten a box of plain white masks and each decorated their own according to their own personality. The Joker's mask is a similar design worn by Cesar Romero's Joker in an episode of the 60s Batman series. But this Joker is, after all, a painter. He uses his own face as a canvas and his his external mask here is a sad clown face, while his internal mask is always smiling. He is a walking paradox of a tragedy mask and a comedy mask. Also to the left of the Joker in the background is a poster for Spider-Man 3 since it was in theaters when they shot this in Chicago. Composer Hans Zimmer's Joker theme starts as a single D note played over electric cello. Zimmer also experimented with razor blades on piano wire and shards of metal on guitar strings. The same sharp edge that gave Joker his scars was used to create his anxiety-inducing music. Music. The music ends when the getaway car pulls up. The driver says, Three of a kind, let's do this. That's it. He thinks he can sit it out and still take a slice. I know why they call him the Joker. Yes, three of a kind, a hand in poker. Poker being a recurring motif in this film. When the chips are down, you need an ace in the hole. Also, the Joker's addresses for Harvey slash Rachel, 250 52nd Street, is an anagram, 25052. There are 52 cards in a deck, not counting two Jokers. So the Joker's plan in this movie is to double the wildcard madman, with Harvey Dent being the second Joker. The Joker playing card is his calling card, as we learned at the end of 2005's Batman Begins when Jim Gordon shared it. And on the evidence bag label, it reads, it was discovered by J. Kerr, with Joseph Kerr being an alien alias for the Joker in the comics. Maybe a clue pointing to this Joker's origin working as a police patrolman. But often discussed with the Dark Knight is the way the Joker uses game theory, which is the discipline of applying mathematical and logical models to social dynamics. This opening heist in which the Joker plays five thieves to eliminate each other one by one is an example of the pirate game, in which the most senior pirate bribes the weakest pirate to conspire against the other so that he can take the biggest share of the loot. And other than the Joker, the last pirate standing is 
the best driver, who one would argue is probably the weakest of the other five. So while the Joker manipulates Gotham's criminals here, his true plan is to activate the most fearful of Gotham, the financially desperate, the mentally ill. In Batman Begins, Ra's al Ghul in the League of Shadows manipulates the city's corruption and infrastructure. In The Dark Knight Rises, Bane in the League of Shadows manipulates the financial elites and the Bolshevik classes. But Joker manipulates just regular, scared folk. He comes not from the shadows or from a prison or from a psych ward or from a war zone or from a freak accident. He comes from broad daylight on the sidewalk. He's one of us. He's a face in the crowd. And that's what makes him so scary. The others speculate about the Joker. I heard he wears makeup. Makeup? Yeah, to scare people. You know, war paint. Like Ra's al Ghul and Begins and Bane and Rises, the Joker begins this movie hiding in plain sight, while others talk about him like he's not in the vicinity. William Fickner plays the bank manager who begins bespectacled and then just with a strong vocal choice reveals his mob connection. You have any idea who you're stealing from? You and your friends are dead! You and your friends are dead! Yeah, that's why the emergency call went out to a private number and why the locksmith has to put his rubber-soled shoes on his hands to avoid getting electrocuted. This is a mob bank, which means no cops are called and means no Batman is notified. The manager fires a shotgun in the direction of innocence in the background, not caring who he hits. The Joker tells the other that the manager is out of rounds, hoping that he'll get shot to make his elimination game easier. Now, Fickner also appeared in Michael Mann's Heat, which Nolan used as a major tonal influence for the Dark Knight film, from an amazing opening heist sequence, though this robbery is really closer to the climactic downtown LA bank robbery in Heat, and the fact that both The Dark Knight and Heat feature midpoint interview scenes where the opposing figures pick each other apart from across the table. And as with Heat, The Dark Knight vastly underestimates the weight of a duffel bag that would be filled with cash, which would actually weigh somewhere around 350 pounds. The manager screams, What do you believe in? I believe whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. It's the Joker's first line of dialogue in this movie, and it's a joke, it's a pretty good pun. But while the line seems to indicate the Joker survived some past trauma, I think we can read this line a different way. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stranger. What doesn't kill in these movies? Batman. So the Joker is joking that Batman is the one who made him stranger. The fear that Batman has stricken into Gotham has led to this madness. And the music we hear on the face reveal goes from D to C. So there is kind of a DC reference there, but overall, what makes The Dark Knight fun to analyze is that it's mostly devoid of Easter eggs. Because Christopher Nolan doesn't really care much for Easter eggs, he instead uses his attention to detail to make you care about the scene that we are currently in and not make you think about some other pop culture thing. And yes, this is our first look at Heath Ledger's face in this movie, and Nolan fills the screen with it. The Glasgow smile was formed by three pieces of stamped silicone. Prosthetic supervisor Connor O'Sullivan told Empire that he thought back to the punk and skinhead era when gang members would have scarred faces like this. And he thought about a specific memory when a delivery of fruit machines was made near his his workshop and that delivery man had a Glasgow smile, also known as the Chelsea smile, and he said that he got that from what he called a dog fight. And the prosthetic supervisor didn't ask any further questions. So the origin of this Joker's scars, of course, remains a mystery. But just that he has them frightens the criminal establishment of Gotham because this new guy can tolerate more pain than they can. Nolan deliberately chose not to define the backstory as a nod to the Joker's multiple choice backstory in The Killing Joke, but also to avoid humanizing him because he's not meant to be seen as a character as he is really just a force of chaos, opposing the order that Batman represents. Nolan was obsessed with the paintings of Francis Bacon, and he wanted to find a way to translate that to Ledger's face. Makeup artist John Caglione Jr. expressed that through the Joker's makeup, instructing Ledger to scrunch up his face and form a wide smile to form creases in his face and all these textures that would make the makeup look cracked when he relaxed his face. That means to get into character, every morning Ledger had to hold this angry face and this really wide smile as the makeup was applied over the course of an hour. Imagine what that would do to your emotional state. Now, Ledger would smear the makeup on his own face for the first camera test so that they could see what it would look like if the Joker had applied it himself. And then after that point, they would do their best to recreate it every day. Though, Ledger would always apply the red lipstick, and since his bottom lip was all prosthetic, he developed this tick of constantly licking it, giving him the appearance of a dog throughout the film. You can even see early interviews Ledger did for the film where he instinctively goes back to this tick when he talks about the prosthetics. Your makeup was incredible. What was that experience like, playing the Joker? I thought it was it was awesome. Yeah, it was it was the most fun I've had playing a character, hands down. And I always notice this little splotch of red on the far right of his smile, which is separated by just a bit of white, which gives it the effect that that part of the scar is actively bleeding through the makeup. And yes, throughout the film, you can always see white paint on the Joker's fingers and under his fingernails in every scene from where he would have applied his own makeup. And to me, that gives a completely different context to the slight alterations to the Joker's makeup scene to scene and how much preparation he put into each step of his plan, what he was doing when we didn't see him, and really what that tells us about him. And I'm gonna be coming back to that throughout this analysis. And yes, 
we cannot overlook Ledger's brilliant performance as the Joker, his costuming inspired by Iggy Pop and Adam Ant, his vibe a bit of Alex from Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, his voice a bit of Tom Waits. I feel like I'm at my grandmother's. <laughs> but this was a singular psychology that Ledger formed by holding up alone in a hotel room for a month. And many believe he paid a price for this role because Ledger did die from an accidental overdose in January 2008. And this film coming out after his death just gave his performance an eternal spooky spectral quality. So the Joker guns down the bus driver without looking as the Joker was described in the Man Who Last graphic novel. Quote, he didn't even look at them like killing them wasn't even important. Now that title, The Man Who Laughs, comes from Victor Hugo's novel and a 1928 film adaptation with a character who has a similarly forced smile. And the Joker using a school bus to mow down a perfectly positioned thief and then driving that bus back into traffic of other school buses. Yeah, it's all a bit silly and convenient, but the theatricality works for a character like the Joker. And it's important because Nolan mixes in the sounds of kids on the other buses to make us worried about this madman just slipping in with all of our kids. He begins as a face in the crowd and he resumes his starting position as one of us. And yes, the film's production crew designed the Gotham license plates to look like Illinois license plates so that the Chicago cars in the background would blend in. Again, a kind of Easter egg, but really just one design to not take us out of the moment. Now that night, Jim Gordon lights up the bat signal and he tells Ramirez that he does this just to remind criminals that Batman might be out there. So as far as he knows, no active crimes are being committed. This is just a preventative fear tactic, but Gordon is actively making the criminal class more paranoid and more desperate. Ramirez hands him a coffee. I thought you had to go look after your mother, detective. Checked you back into the hospital. Yeah, we get this line early to establish Ramirez as vulnerable. Really, this movie's whole second half hinges on Ramirez's decision to kidnap Harvey Dent. In every scene she's in, she drops little clues that she's gonna turn on us. Killian Murphy returns from Batman Begins as Dr. Jonathan Crane, Scarecrow, in a drug deal with the Chechen, complaining that Crane's hallucinogenic drugs are making his customers bug out. These damaged souls are growing in number in the city, and these are the folks the Joker will recruit. A few copycat Batman attack with guns and hockey pads. These are based on the Sons of Batman from Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, but I I like how Nolan smartly shoots these first two action sequences in daylight and then a brightly lit parking garage. This makes the action crisp and clear with high contrast, and we see how Nolan is improving on his darkly lit action from Batman Begins. Now, it's interesting how Gordon and Batman don't arrive to that hit mob bank until over 24 hours later, like a day has definitely passed, which tells us that the mob didn't report this until after they had a chance to regroup. Gordon shows Batman the security photo of the Joker, and he is looking directly at the camera of it, and its date is July 18th, 2008 which was this movie's release date. Alfred finds Bruce in his temporary bat cave since the mansion and cave burned down in Batman Begins, but Nolan always shoots this location in this cool way, having the ceiling and its diagonal lines take up like two thirds of the frame. And Nolan comes back to this interior framing for any time these makeshift bat caves show up just to kind of suggest a subterranean feel. Harvey Dent prosecutes Sal Moroni, who took over the Falcone crime operation since Carmine Falcone was arrested in Batman Begins. And the witness pulls a carbon fiber gun on him, recalling the long Halloween comics when Sal Moroni throws ass Acid on Harvey Dent's face, making him two-faced. But here, Dent tells Maroney, Main China. If you want to kill a public servant, Mr. Maroney, I recommend you buy American. This pro-American sentiment doesn't just mirror Lao as an ineffective route for the mob to launder their money, but it shows that an American everyman like the Joker will ultimately do far more damage to Gotham's public servants. The Dark Knight as a film really is a story about city politics. If I didn't work with cops, she'd investigate it. While you were making your name at IA, I'd be working alone. This shows that Gordon is aware that the cops that he works with are not saints. He is smart and he tries his best to compartmentalize. Gordon tells Dent, well, You don't have to sell me, Dent. We all know you're Gotham's white knight. I heard they have a different name for me down at MCU. Yeah, of course, the other name is Harvey Two-Face, but Dent as the White Knight contrasts Batman as the titular Dark Knight of this movie. It's a story about how Gotham can only survive with the illusion of a White Knight while being shadow defended by a Dark Knight. But in these opening scenes, we have to note that Dent is not morally pure. His double-sided coin is an instrument of manipulation. He uses it to take lead in the Moroni trial ahead of Rachel, despite being late to the trial and Rachel being far more prepared, just so that he can score political points. And he also says that he uses this coin to score his first date with Rachel. I just think we forget that Harvey Dent starts this movie as kind of a manipulative jackass. Meanwhile, Bruce asks Lucius Fox for a new suit. Three buttons is a little 90s, Mr. Wayne. You want to be able to turn your head. Sure, man, backing out of the driveway easier. Yeah, two nods there to the 90s version of the bat suit in which Batman couldn't turn his head without turning his whole body. During dinner, we see Christian Bale channel his Patrick Bateman rich prick energy. And it's just interesting to watch Rachel in these moments because she knows that Bruce is playing a character. Who appointed the Batman? We did. All of us who stood by and let scum take control of our city. 
Bruce is doing this as a test to see if Harvey Dent will yes and his elitism, but Harvey, to his credit, doesn't take the Bateman bait. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. They're talking about Julius Caesar, who took control of Rome but never gave up his power, becoming a dictator. The point being, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And of course, foreshadows Harvey Dent in this movie having to die a hero so that Gotham won't know that he lived long enough to become the villain, while Batman lives on as that pariah as the film ends. But there is something deeper here, that Dent believes the system itself is toxic, and that Gotham and all society cannot be redeemed by steady public leadership. He believes only by martyrs who make enemies and die before their time. So really, Harvey Dent is laying out the thematic gauntlet for Bruce in this movie. Can society be cured from the shadows? And is there a way to do that without scaring everyone out of their wits as the Joker does? The ballerina Natasha hints at the answer here, covering half of Dent's face with the white paper, making him a masked white knight, but also foreshadowing how half his face will be disfigured and need to be covered up, but you know, with a hot dog fold instead of a hamburger. Lau meets with Maroney, the Chechen and Gamble, telling them he already moved their money before Gordon's raid thanks to Mr. Maroney's well-placed sources, referring to Ramirez. Notice how Ramirez is the last detective to enter that bank. She hangs back. Now, while the Chechen entered this bank from one end, passing through the metal detectors, this is supposed to be the only entrance they know about in the scene other than the one that the Joker leaves through, the Joker enters through a completely different part of the room, through the back. Ooh, he, ha, ha, and I thought my jokes were bad. So think about it, to get in this room, Joker must have had to hole up in this kitchen, like in a cupboard, a fridge, an oven, overnight before the monsters arrived, and waited. Yes, he could have bought someone off, but at this point in the movie, he's still an unknown to all of them. I just think our man was patient, because one detail about his makeup here, the black paint around his eyes has melted a bit. I think he was sweating in a cramped oven for over 12 hours. The Joker shows off his great pencil trick. Ta -da! It's... Yeah, the Joker put a pencil through the guy's eye socket. It's called transorbital intracranial penetrating injury. It happens so fast, it feels like magic. And the Joker says, Oh, and by the way, the suit, it wasn't cheap. You ought to know, you bought it. Yeah, he's telling them that he was eavesdropping earlier when Maroney said, Where's a cheap purple suit and makeup? He not the problem, he's a nobody. We cannot look away from Ledger's painted face in this movie, and it's partly because of the way he moves it. He tilts his head forward in this scene so that the whites of his eyes beneath his pupils contrast more sharply with the black makeup. It's a meeker, more inviting pose, struck by someone who's clearly spent a lot of time in front of a mirror testing to see how his painted face will look at different angles. Joker offers to kill the Batman for... Half. You're crazy. I'm not. No, I'm not. Gamble seems to have touched a nerve by calling him crazy, and Joker does this little twitch with his eye. The Joker has been diagnosed by real psychologists as a psychopath, but he doesn't consider himself crazy. The Joker's offer is another example of game theory called the shrinking pie game, in which two kids have an ice cream pie that's quickly melting, and the longer they take to figure out how to split it, the less pie they'll have to eat each. The idea being, waiting is costly, and applied to the mobsters of this scene, every seizure of their profits is the shrinking pie, and according to the economic mathematical rules of the shrinking pie game, Offering to take 50% is actually a very generous offer, which is why Joker thinks he's not crazy for offering it. Meanwhile, Dent, Batman, and Gordon meet atop the police building, and I just realized it was Harvey Dent who lit the bat signal, and Gordon arrives at the top of the rooftop, gun drawn, thinking it was a criminal trying to trap one of them. All three men here are trying to save Gotham in their own way. You got the White Knight idealist in Harvey Dent, the Grey Knight realist in Jim Gordon, and the Dark Knight supernatural force in Batman. All of them are paranoid that the Joker is taking advantage of the daylight in between them. Though we should note, Dent is dead right that it was Gordon's rookie Ramirez who leaked the raid. Nolan conveys their disorientation in the scene by orbiting the camera around them clockwise, letting the actors just shout at each other in real time. And it reminds me of Spielberg's shot in Jaws, where Brody, Hooper, and the mayor have it out. And in this analogy, where you have the lawman, the elected public servant, that would leave Hooper as Batman? He is a rich kid with fancy gear. And it's interesting with this orbiting shot, Nolan uses a parallel shot on Joker with Rachel in the party, and he initially moves the camera clockwise to show how all of this spinning out of control, this tornado, started with the Joker. Another common Nolan shot that he loves to use, a sleek drawer sliding open. He uses a similar shot in Tenet. Lucius recommends a real CIA surface-to-air recovery system called Skyhook, which is also featured in the 007 Thunderball. Christopher Nolan, huge fan of James Bond movies, and he often works in references into his films. Lucius says that the new armor should work fine against cats, if not dogs, in 1992's Batman Returns. The Catwoman does stick a claw in the gap between Batman's suit, and while a different Catwoman appears in Dark Knight Rises, the female villain Talia al Ghul stabs Batman in between his armor. The Joker poses as a 
corpse to surprise Gamble. After Heath Ledger's death, they did consider taking a shot out of the movie, but it works really well, obviously, because he's not dead. He stabs two guys in the guts and he uses that as leverage to quickly spring up toward Gamble. And again, the Joker's makeup tells a hidden story here. Compared to the kitchen scene, now notice how the white and black makeup has melted off. He didn't reapply because he wanted to look like he's been dead for a while, but he did recently reapply his lipstick. It's bright red because compared to the last scene, now he pushes his chin outward toward Gamble to make him look directly at the scars. And I just realized that the Joker's word choice with Gamble is a direct callback to their earlier exchange in the kitchen. Gamble called him crazy and Joker uses the same word to describe his dad and really underlines it. My father was a drinker and one night he goes off crazier than usual. Now, of course, the Joker, we learn later, is an unreliable narrator. He is making all this up, and he is using Gamble, calling him crazy before, to paint his sob story about how he could be, in Gamble's eyes, crazy. And remember, earlier he snapped, no, I'm not, popping that T at the end of not, and Ledger pops the T here as well. He doesn't like that. Not one bit. Not one bit. There's just so many little acting choices by Ledger I'm just seeing now. And as the Joker heightens his story to Gamble, at the very end, he shifts his eyeline to Gamble's lieutenant to reveal the story is not for Gamble, it's for the guy he wants to try to recruit. Why so serious? Joker snaps a pool stick and drops it in the middle of Gamble's three lieutenants, which is exactly what Joker's trying to do with the three heads of Gotham, turning them against each other. Now, the Hong Kong section of the movie sometimes feels like Christopher Nolan just trying to do a globe-trotting espionage sequence in the vein of 007, an excuse to shoot a massive city in IMAX. But watching it now, I think we need it in the film to show the height of Batman's power. Because in every other action scene in this movie, Batman takes a humanistic beating, or outright loses. And we need one insane supernatural victory from the Batman, a timed extraction from a skyscraper so that Batman has a greater height to fall from. Like when Batman plants the time bombs on the windows, they count down from two minutes and 23 seconds and in real time with film's runtime, two minutes and 23 seconds later, they detonate. The plausibility here sells the win. Batman does this in real time and he uses a real CIA skyhook device to pull off an extradition for an American city's district attorney. Harvey and Rachel use Rico from Lau's bookkeeping to try all the mob leaders together. Judge Cirillo finds a Joker card in her docket. Since they later find traces of her DNA on a clue, it means that someone close to her is in the Joker's network. The Joker, as we see throughout this movie, is increasingly becoming everywhere. And yes, while it's a bit of theatrics by Harvey Dent to try 549 criminals all at once, Dent does this to stun these gangs with steep bail costs so that their operations cannot adjust fast enough. It's clever, but it's also the kind of manipulation the Joker uses to overwhelm Gotham with crisis after crisis after crisis to immobilize the city. Again, like every deck of cards, this movie really has two Jokers. Mayor Anthony Garcia warns, if they get anything on you, and those criminals are back on the streets, followed swiftly by you and me. Yeah, Nolan is really effective at jump scares as he proved in Inception. Now, this poor guy is hockey pads from earlier. Joker painted his face like this and he pinned a Joker card with the slim shady reference with a real Batman, please stand up. Heath Ledger himself shot this handheld footage of the wannabe Batman, Brian Douglas. And notice how he is killing him in a butcher shop with dead pigs hanging. Symbolism here being Joker's way of calling Batman a pig. Joker growls at me. Oh my God. In addition to Ledger's terrifying voice, if you listen a bit longer, you can hear him again licking his scars from behind the camera. The Joker is obsessed with people looking at him, and he says the same words to Rachel later. Look at me. So at this fundraiser, Dent meets Alfred. Yeah, Rachel talks about you all the time. You, you've known her her whole life. Oh, not yet. Foreshadowing that Rachel's life will end by the end of this movie, Bruce arrives in style with three dates, heightening the two dates he crashed the restaurant with in Batman Begins. Their dress colors with Bruce's black suit, some say reflect the magenta, yellow, black, and cyan colors of the CMYK printers used for comic books. I don't know about that. I just think Bruce wanted a peacock to play the part of a rich prick. Bruce tosses his drink over the balcony, and later, the Joker will also toss out his drink before pantomiming a sip from the glass. Both of these men are playing the part of party goers, but actually probably hate being at parties. Meanwhile, Judge Cirillo and Commissioner Loeb get assassinated, lobed by poison, Cirillo by car bomb. Though Cirillo really should have suspected these cops letting her drive her own car and claiming to not know her destination. And I just noticed that as her car blows up, the crooked cop in the passenger seat starts to smile and say, boom, to make fun of her. Joker crashes the party and eats an appetizer. He chews it quickly, kind of like a dog, because with the scars, it would make it harder for him to use his cheeks to keep the food in place. The party guest who reminds him of his father is actually US Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont, who cameos in many Batman films. When Joker first approaches Rachel, the camera moves clockwise, but after he grabs her 
face, Nolan pivots to make the camera orbit counterclockwise, which makes this moment especially disorienting because I maintain it is the most unnerving part of the film. He changes his scar story from child abuse to self-mutilation to please a wife. So A, we now can't trust anything he says, and B, we feel Rachel's discomfort. As a woman, he's just called beautiful, hearing a story about how he scarred himself to reflect a scarred lover. I just wanted to know it. I don't care about the scars. Zimmer's electric strings bend up the scale, sounding like a plane crashing. And I could be wrong, but Ledger and Gyllenhaal are so sharply in focus, it looks like they're plated in over the background. Like Nolan got this spinning shot separately on a green screen to get the movement perfect and didn't want to interrupt Ledger's take. And there's a little tell here, once again, hidden in the Joker's makeup, a bit of moisture beneath his nose. In one shot, catching the light of the wall behind him because I think that wet spot reflected green screen and it got keyed out. But when the Joker leans back to say, now I'm always smiling, his makeup has changed a little bit. It's a bit faded, his hair is a bit looser. I think we're back to the actual penthouse set for this take. What creeps me out about discovering this green screen cover up is that Nolan inserted into the bigger scene this particular take with this anecdote about the gambling wife, which makes me wonder if Ledger could have done a dozen close up takes with a dozen different backstories. His multiple choice origin could be even more multiple choice than we thought. I told you, there are so many details hidden in the Joker's makeup that no one, I think 15 years later, has talked about these. So please subscribe to this channel. That's my mission with all of these deep dives and I feel like I've delivered on everyone so far. Now Batman doesn't let the Joker tell him where in Gotham City he can't go. He has full access to Gotham, just like you could have full access to your favorite streaming library if you were using ExpressVPN. Did you know that Netflix has over 17,500 titles in their catalog? But in the United States, you only get 6,500 of those. You are missing out on two thirds of their shows. ExpressVPN VPN lets you set your location to any one of over 90 countries. So if you can't find what you're looking for, just look up where it is playing online and chances are they have it. Like if you finish watching The Dark Knight and you wanna follow it up with Joker, just to see the different take on the character, change your location to France and voila. ExpressVPN works on your phone, your laptop, even smart TVs. So you can watch your shows from the comfort of your couch or on the go. And it's super fast, so there's zero buffering. I use ExpressVPN all the time when I'm researching these videos. It's really an essential part of the Movie Nerds Toolkit. ExpressVPN has been called the best VPN of 2023, so give it a try for yourself. Go to expressvpn.com slash the deep dive to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN. Free. Now we're so close in on these two that Batman's sudden appearance right beside them kind of makes visual sense, but uh, not really. Like Nolan's frantic cutting during this fight makes it a bit hard to follow, but Nolan smartly ends the fight with this punchline. Let her go. Very poor choice of words. And as Batman lunges after her, you can see the Joker laughing as he steps aside, which is something he makes note of later. The way you threw yourself after her. Bruce tells Alfred, Criminals aren't complicated, Alfred. Bruce is accidentally echoing Ra's al Ghul from Batman Begins. A criminal is not complicated. This shows how Bruce is nearsighted. He's not yet adapted to this new class of criminal. So Alfred shares his story of hunting a bandit in Burma who kept throwing the jewels away. Some men just want to watch the world burn. This was the line in the very first 2007 teaser for The Dark Knight, and this, along with Ledger's unhinged Joker laugh, was enough to sell us on this movie. Some men just want to watch the world burn. I'm the man of my word. <laughs> Alfred suggests there is no why to this kind of pyromania, that some men are just advocates of chaos. And I think the fear that this movie dances with is the prospect that all men, somewhere in their hearts, want to watch the world burn. But true heroism is not burning down our worlds around us, it's braving the heat and standing strong. Now, The Dark Knight does feature a bit of detective work with Batman cutting a brick with a lodged bullet from the Patrick Harvey Richard Dent crime scene so that he can re-engineer the shattered bullet to get a fingerprint. This will lead Batman to an apartment of another criminal named Melvin White, whose fingerprint the Joker used for this bullet, a room where the Joker keeps the kidnapped honor guard and rigged this window shade to distract the snipers. So did the Joker know that they would be able to pull a print from the brick using some advanced ballistics tech? Is this a clue that the Joker was actually a cop? Did he set all of this up? Look, there are a lot of steps to the Joker's overall plan in this movie that don't really hold up under logical scrutiny. Like that a surgically implanted gut bomb would knock out everyone in the police station, but leave him standing. That's why it's just best to think of the Joker as a force of chaos. Murphy's Law embodied the pre-interstellar definition of Murphy's Law, and not really a human bound by the same laws of nature and plausibility as we are. That's kind of what makes him so creepy and compelling in this movie. But we can say, based on Batman having given Gordon irradiated bills, it's safe to say that Joker knew Gordon and Batman had some super detective tech, and yes, he might have designed this step of the plan to place Batman in a sniper's nest during the mayor's assassination, to make it easier for him to assassinate the mayor while the snipers are directed elsewhere, to make Batman a Lee Harvey Oswald patsy while the Joker was able to fire from the grassy knoll. Really? I think 
think the Joker's actual wink in this crime scene comes in the premature obituary that he printed. Not only does he foretell that he'll use a high-powered rifle to kill the mayor, he also slips in a future target for the movie, Gotham General Hospital. And I think this means the Joker already planted bombs in this hospital. He has set up the entire city of Gotham as a game of mousetrap. The accountant Coleman Reese tries to blackmail Wayne Enterprises, but Lucius calls his bluff. Now, you got the entire R&D department burning through cash, claiming it's related to cell phones for the army. Cell phones! So earlier, remember, Lucius told Reese to check the accounts again just to keep him busy. But only now did Reese find something new. And it is because Bruce went behind Lucius's back to expand the phone sonar tech that Lucius used in Hong Kong. So Lucius wasn't sloppy, it was Bruce desperately rushing a surveillance tool to find the Joker that he knew Lucius would shut down if he knew about it. And that's what raised the red flag for Reese. On the day of Commissioner Loeb's funeral, we get our one look at the Joker's unpainted face as he disguises himself as a cop in the honor guard in plain sight. It's crazy how several moments before we actually see him in close up, he's standing right there, front and center, directly in the eye line of the people on stage. Dent, Gordon, Rachel, he is right there, guys. So this shows us that despite his recurring demands to look at me, the only face that they've been seeing is the clown makeup facade the Joker paints for them, not his real face and his actual scars. And perhaps the scariest face the Joker bears in this movie is this one, the one he doesn't paint. So why does Jim Gordon pretend to be dead in this moment? I think he recognizes the only way he'll get the Joker to stop firing at the stage is if the Joker thinks he got another high profile police target instead of the mayor. And notice how, as the Joker and his guys scramble, just notice that David Desmalchian's character named Thomas Schiff is flashing the creepiest, whitest grin as he turns to flee. Din kidnaps Schiff, and while Batman interrogates Maroney by dropping him from a ledge only high enough to break his legs, Dent presses a hot gun barrel against Schiff's head, freaking him out with a coin flip. Batman stops him. He's a paranoid schizophrenic, former patient at Arkham, the kind of mind the Joker attracts. So Batman's saying that the Joker is recruiting the mentally ill of Gotham, particularly the people who are already afraid of everything. The Joker is not the enemy, the overall concept of fear is. Now again, Dent's coin is double-sided, but flipping it over and over, it's definitely a kind of psychological torture that Gotham's White Knight District Attorney should not engage in. It wasn't the face burning that turns Harvey mad, or even losing Rachel. It's the fear and anxiety that's plaguing the city. The fear that also pushes Bruce to nearly turn himself in, despite what Alfred advises. And you Master Wayne. They'll hate you for it, but that's the point of Batman. Yeah, indeed. It is scary to be hated, but a true hero is not always loved. That's not the job of the hero. During Dent's press conference, the crowd heckles, Things are worse than ever. She turned himself in. I love this because this is a press conference. This man is a professional journalist, you know, from the same class of Gotham media who let the Joker run a death threat as a full page obituary. What are the journalistic standards of Gotham? Anyway, I just like this detail because the press corps are clearly as freaked out as the average citizens are. Dent says in his speech, The night is dark is just before the dawn. Unless he's referring to a setting moon just before the dawn, nights typically aren't darkest at that point. They are sometimes coldest at that point, but still this shows an optimistic outlook, a false optimism, and a bit of wordplay. Because for Harvey Dent, the white knight will go dark, and our dark knight will fulfill his black hat status and go darkest as the movie closes on a sunrise. Harvey begins this movie sharing a duality with Batman, the white knight and dark knight, the flip side of the double-sided coin, but that will change in the second half of the movie as Harvey Dent transforms into the second Joker in the deck of cards. So Dent claims to be Batman and he gets transferred. And I like how Stevens applauds while Wirtz just kind of glares at him, either not believing he's Batman or hating the idea of vigilantism, while Stevens respects vigilante justice, hinting that he will try to take matters into his own hands with the Joker later. Big mistake. During the transfer, the Joker redirects the convoy with a burning fire truck, fire again being his tool, onto Chicago's Lower Wacker Drive. The Joker crashes in with a semi truck carrying circus equipment, laughter is the best medicine, but with an S written to the left to make it the word slot is the best medicine. But Joker hits Harvey's truck with gunfire and RPGs, and Batman's tumbler arrives to ram the garbage truck. Since that tilted truck would damage the roof of Lower Wacker Drive, Nolan's team accomplished this with one third scale models of the tumbler, of the truck, and 145 feet of a small baby Lower Wacker Drive. I love it when movies do this, because it looks so good. Nolan specifically pulls off this illusion by underexposing the model set to match exactly the underexposure that they had in the actual Chicago street. Really, Christopher Nolan's best action has always been with cars and planes and other vehicles, he's not as good with hand-to-hand -hand combat or with gunfights. And I think it's just because he grew up a fan of 007 movies and the best action in that franchise, at least in the earlier decades that he grew up with, would have been car chases. Like it wasn't until Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig where James Bond was doing any kind of cool fist fights or martial arts. Whereas Joker heightens with bigger and bigger hardware, Batman downsizes from the tumbler to the bat pod. And I don't know why it took me so long to realize this, but the motorcycle isn't the wheels on the driver's side of the tumbler, like the front and the back wheels, it's both front wheels 
the tumbler and that axle breaking off the front of the tumbler and Batman hinges the passenger wheel behind him to form this motorcycle. And it looks just so cool. And when it comes to crashing huge vehicles, Nolan always insists on going practical. The train in downtown LA and Inception, the plane and Tenet, and here, the flipping truck. Nolan's special effects supervisor, Chris Corbold, accomplished this with a massive TNT powered piston beneath the truck bed to flip the truck, which they had to angle perfectly since they were shooting in Chicago's LaSalle Street. Cinematographer Wally Feister shooting an IMAX used two primary angles, one from the side, which required just a bit of VFX editing to paint out the piston. You can actually see the little blur where they did this. And then the front on shot to get the effect of a driver on the street level observing this. As the Joker climbs out of the truck, he is just walking chaos. He stumbles out, he releases some gunfire, and then he walks right into the tow cables. Just a mess. And yes, this street standoff with the gun in the approaching Batman does recall the 1989 Joker's duel with that Batman. The Joker really does bait Batman into killing him, firing on innocent drivers both to clear the road and to piss Batman off. Come on, I want you to do it. I want you to do it. Come on, hit me. He knows that if Batman kills the Joker here in the street, the Batman will lose all moral authority. But Batman swerves before they collide, unstoppable force, immovable object. They repel each other like magnets. But Gordon arrests the Joker, revealing himself disguised as one of the drivers of that truck. The long Halloween comic storyline also features Batman posing as a SWAT officer and Dent faking his death, but both of these get reassigned to Gordon in this movie. Gordon faking his death remains one of the more logically muddy aspects of this film. The novelization says he wore a bulletproof vest on the day of the funeral, but it seems like Batman didn't know he was dead, no one did. I don't know how he kept it a secret, but really he played all of them to capture the Joker. And yet, like John Doe in Seven, the Joker wanted to get arrested to get Lau. I just think the Joker knew that whether it was killing Dent or killing Batman or Batman killing him or Joker just getting arrested, the Joker had enough traps spring-loaded around Gotham for any contingency. Ramirez escorts Dent to a car driven by Warts, and the camera stays on Ramirez. She knows Dent is immediately being traded to Maroney for leverage. So the Joker gets arrested, and the last thing out of his pocket is a potato peeler, which is a bit disturbing? Like, is he peeling skin off faces? But perhaps even more unsettling is the Joker's makeup in the scene, because when he was outside on the street, his forehead was sweating off the makeup. Now, in the holding cell, it's fresh and reapplied. Some ally on the inside gave him a chance to reapply. As he sarcastically applauds Commissioner Gordon, you can see fresh white paint on his fingers from when he reapplied that makeup. When Gordon first questions the Joker about Harvey's abduction, the Joker has all the power. His face is lit only from the side by a dim lamp, making him look like a ghost from the shadows. His makeup makes him look like a melted candle in the shot. The Joker in the shot just looks like a freaking Rembrandt painting. But when Gordon leaves and flips on the light, and Batman appears suddenly behind him, all the Joker's facial details come into light. Batman slams his head on the table. Never start with the head. The victim gets all fuzzy. Now, some have taken this to mean that the Joker might have been a military interrogator or torturer. I just think he's trolling Batman by calling himself a victim, suggesting Batman doing this to him is what Joker did to that copycat Batman, Brian Douglas. Joker rubs his wrist against part of his forehead, and now some of his makeup smears off. Joker wants Batman to see the skin beneath the makeup here, a tactic to make it seem like he's showing his cards, because he often tilts his bare forehead forward, as he did back in the kitchen, signaling he wants to cut a deal. He wants his audience that he's talking to to understand him. Now, normally in dialogue, scene shot over the shoulder like this, one character stays on the right side of frame while the other stays on the left side as the editor intercuts. It's called the 180 degree rule. Nolan starts with Batman on the left, both in this close up and the reverse shot of the Joker and the Joker on the right side of frame. But then after Batman asks, where's Dent? We cut back to the Joker and Nolan has shifted the Joker to the left while Batman is now on the right. Nolan slides again after this, shifting Batman back to the left and Joker back to the right. So Nolan is violating the eyeline rule to show the Joker getting inside Batman's head, urging him to violate his no killing rule. The Joker says, I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? No, you, you complete me. Yeah, Ledger impersonates Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire. Maybe a joke about Tom Cruise's wife at the time, Katie Holmes, formerly blamed Batman's love interest. The Joker considers him and Batman dual figures. Joker is just unbound by a hypocritical code. To them, you're just a freak. Like me. See, I'm not a monster. I'm just ahead of the curve. Yeah, Joker's so pompous here. He speaks like he's a more evolved strain of human, but really just doing that to piss off Batman because it breaks Batman's patience because he refuses to tolerate someone saying mankind is destined to devolve into this kind of madness. Now that Batman has gotten physical, Joker knows that he can tease that both Dent and Rachel were taken and that Batman totally loses it. Where are they? Ah, by breaking this mirror glass, Batman has made a huge error. He leaves Joker with broken pieces of glass, sharp edges, that Joker will later use to escape. Batman's selfish rage allows the chaos to spill in. The take that won Heath Ledger the Oscar, I'm convinced, comes right here. <laughs> you have 
nothing. Oh my God, the shift from having the air punched out of him to using that same suffocation to instead be him trying to catch his breath from laughter. It's pure anarchy. So Joker at this point tells Batman two addresses and then Batman leaves. Which one you going after? Rachel. Yeah, Batman says this before the door closes so Joker can hear who we went after. He went after Rachel. But the truth is, Joker intentionally told Batman the opposite locations because he knows Batman on that bat pod will be faster than the cops are and he wants Dent still alive and Rachel to die to fridge Rachel to hurt both of these men. And by hearing Batman say who's going after before that door closed, he knows he was victorious in that tactic. Joker taunts Stevens by asking which of the six friends that he killed were cowards as the poor mentally ill man in the holding cell collapses. Boss said he'd make the voices go away. <laughs> he said he'd go inside and replace him with bright lights. This is so sad to me. This guy was a schizophrenic and Joker promised to make his voices go away, but really he makes those voices go away with just a bomb implant that kills him and the bright light being the explosion. Rachel dies in an explosion, half of Harvey Dent's face burns, becoming the true Harvey Two-Face, and Joker escapes with the accountant Lau. As Batman stands over the smoldering ruins at 250 52nd Street, he finds a double-sided coin. In screenplay structure, this part of a story is literally called the Dark Knight of the Soul because this is the moment that forges Batman turning him into the Dark Knight. When a hero hits rock bottom after a false victory and after he's forced to give up what he wants the most. And for Batman, that was the false hope of a peaceful life with Rachel. Meanwhile, the Joker celebrates by sticking his head out the car window of a cop car like a dog, licking his lips. Later, Joker literally describes himself as a dog chasing cars. And it mirrors the cynic Diogenes of Greek philosophy, the founder of cynicism, who is known for his dog-like behavior and belief in the virtue of dogs. So Batman places Harvey's coin by his hospital bed and he puts the clean, unburnt face facing up, as he will later do to this white knight face after he dies. Dent realizes Rachel's death from the same coin he used to manipulate her. One face of it now being burned away, just like half his face is burned away. Alfred consoles Bruce in the penthouse. We had a little breakfast. Very well then. Alfred. Yes, Bruce Wayne. Should I bring this on her? This little moment mirrors Alfred's moment with young Bruce and Batman Begins. I thought I might prepare a little supper. Very well. Alfred. Yes, Master Bruce. It was my fault. And if you listen closely, the same tragic Hans Zimmer music is playing in both of these scenes. Alfred mostly consoles Bruce by refusing to let him read Rachel's breakup letter. It's not. It can wait. Ah, and thus begins a noble lie that divides Alfred and Bruce in The Dark Knight Rises. Alfred knows that the final shred of hope that Bruce has is the thought that Rachel died loving him. And he knows sometimes a lie is more helpful than the truth. And so Alfred tells him how they caught the bandit. We burned the forest down. And by doing this, Alfred is giving Bruce permission to cheat in this game with the Joker, to fight the Joker's fire with fire of his own. That fire being bat sonar surveillance and a vast invasion of privacy in Gotham. This is not a virtuous tactic, and Nolan underscores this necessary evil with this abrupt edit. We burned the forest down. Ah, the lawman awakens when the rule of law is defiled. Now to create the visual effect of Two-Face in this movie, Nolan asked his artists to be subtractive rather than additive because Dent's face would have been burned away, not makeup layered on top. Nolan told sculptor Julian Murray not to make it too realistic though because the gore would take the viewer out of the moment. Like for example, that eyeball should have been dripping out of the socket, but for a dangling eyeball bumping up against his cheek muscles, that just would have been too distracting. And really we need that angry eye in place to connect with the damaged soul within. VFX company Framestore used trackers on the other half of Eckhart's face as a reference for these shifting exposed muscles. Nolan told Eckhart to act each scene two different ways, once with Harvey's more restrained anger, and then another take with just unleashed rage, and then Nolan composited both together to literally convey the two halves of Two-Face's identity. But because they had to erase parts of his face, they ended up blocking this in really clever ways so that we only initially see the edge of his scarring on the other side of his face, just the tip of that erased lip. But the challenge being the pillow behind it it also had to be painted in. Artist Tim Weber told the amazing Channel Quarter crew recently that they had to recomposite Eckhart's eyeball, but they kept his natural pupil. So they tried to keep as much of his actual body parts in the shot, like his teeth, but for some shots, they did have to partially reanimate all of his teeth so that the lighting and surfaces would match with the exposed new teeth that they had to animate on the other side of his face. So Joker puts Lau at the top of the mob's money stacked in a pyramid. Film theorists estimated that pyramid at 10 tiers overall, 30 stacks of cash high, per tier, assuming $10,000 stacks, to be a total 
of $4,688,000,000. And that it would take at least 27 hours to assemble. It's just another example of how the Joker in this movie is not a true agent of chaos as he claims to be. He's more of just an agent, a calculating planner, an organizer. And he puts all that planning to serve the purpose of appearing to be unhinged. It's all an act. Really, this has been my issue with the live action Jokers since Heath Ledger. All of them amazing actors, but their Jokers are truly unhinged and truly damaged so that they're more reactive and they miss out on the aspect of the Joker that Ledger and Jack Nicholson truly understood that the Joker is a planner. He's a type A personality. He doesn't reflect the true madness of society. He just exploits that madness with steady discipline and coherent vision and great execution. Meanwhile, the Batman in this movie also does his homework. Like when he and Alfred run through all the names of cops that have hospitalized family members, Bruce names these cops from memory. He's done all the prep work. This battle in the Dark Knight really comes down to which planner knows the people of Gotham better. So the Joker is not a dog chasing cars, he's really a proud laborer. This town deserves a better class of criminal. I'm gonna give it to him. This is my city. And as he burns Lau alive at the top of that stack, you just can't help but sense a bit of Nolan himself griping at the studios for burning money on things that don't contribute to a film's meaning. It's not about money. It's about sending a message. Now, we should note that the Joker does alter his plan at this point in the movie. With Harvey scarred and it being public news that he's in a hospital recovering, the Joker now sees a new Joker card to play. And so he decides to silence Coleman Reese. So overall, the Joker isn't following a perfectly structured plan, he really just set up various contingencies ahead of time and he plays the hand he gets dealt. And one of those contingencies is to send the city scrambling to evacuate the hospitals. And this wasn't to silence Reese or just to cause chaos, it was really so that he could get close to Harvey Dent. Now yes, it is very silly that Harvey Dent does not realize this nurse is a choker until after he takes off the mask that doesn't cover his eye makeup. But really, Harvey Dent was just recently sleeping when the Joker shot that cop, so I think Dent is just kind of delirious and coming too. Like, notice on the pillow beside him are those gooey stains from his face. I think he was obviously sleeping a moment ago, and he's just kind of out of it. So the Joker blames the schemers of Gotham. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. I try to show the schemers how pathetic their attempts to control things really are. This is an outright lie. It's designed to manipulate Harvey Dent. The Joker is totally a schemer. So the point of this scene is not a defense of nihilism or a creed against the system. We're really just watching a manipulator using these kind of talking points to unhinge the vulnerable. Everything the Joker says and does here is choreographed. He talks about Rachel on the side of Harvey's face that is unscarred, and then he moves to the other side of the bed and talks about anarchy on the side of Harvey's face that is monstrous, appealing to his darker nature. And when the Joker puts puts Harvey's hands on the gun to press it against his head, Joker keeps his index finger on the hammer of the gun so that even if Harvey tried to pull the trigger, he would not be able to. His illusion is chaos. His reality is total control. Joker says, If tomorrow I tell the press that I'd like a gangbanger will get shot, or a truckload of soldiers will be blowing up, nobody panics. Now, while some have interpreted this to think the Joker might have been former military, he also sounds like a guy who just read By American in Harvey Dent's public court transcript and then appeals to this politician in the saluting troop fashion. That's really why the Joker wears this I believe in Harvey Dent sticker in this moment. And you'll notice Joker has white makeup once again on his fingers, but on the outside of his fingers. And he goes gloveless in the scene, despite masquerading as a masked nurse who would be wearing latex gloves. Why does he do this? Well, I think the Joker thoughtfully painted the outside of his fingers in addition to his face to make him look like a sloppy dog chasing cars, when really this kind of smoky eye would take way more precision. He didn't chaotically smear this on his face, he took his time. And I think his white fingers on the outside of his fingers became part of that mask, which is why I think as he leaves the room, he cleans his hands. All of this chaos is really just an illusion. Joker also says here, Oh, and you know the thing about chaos, it's fair. Yes, he's appealing to fairness for Harvey Dent. But let's remember, fairness does not always equal justice. For example, it's fair to let the parent of a murdered kid seek vengeance against the murderer, but the just course of action is to leave it to the state to do the prosecution, because that personal bloodlust will only hurt the afflicted more. And I like how Ledger pronounces fair almost like he's saying the word fear. It's fair because it's not really chaos or fairness that he's wielding against the people of Gotham, it's their fear. Bruce opts against the bat pod in daylight hours for his Lamborghini Murcielago, which is Spanish for the word bat. So it's a literal Batmobile. And I kind of feel like Bruce used this Batmobile to send a message to Coleman Reese 
that he knows, he knows he's Batman. Joker's hospital bomb doesn't fully detonate at first, which surprises him. And there's a myth that I used to believe that Ledger improvised this reaction, but this delayed explosion was actually planned and perfectly timed by Christopher Nolan and his special effects team to give the Joker this character beat. So what seems like chaos and unhingedness is really part of the plan. Joker hangs Mike Engel, played by Anthony Michael Hall, upside down to read this message. Thus why the papers float upwards. He is upside down like a bat. And this is how the Joker will end the movie, upside down like a bat, but shot right side up. So Batman decides to burn the forest down with a vast surveillance system, which may have been inspired by the listening post exhibit at London Science Museum. And in the years since the Dark Knight, the expansion of smartphones has actually made it easier for people to be tracked just like this in real time. But in the aughts, Nolan was really responding to the United States Patriot Act and the rise of the surveillance state to combat terrorism. Now, Nolan is sometimes critiqued for what some people say is promoting military technology, but literally every one of Nolan's films focus on how horrifyingly dangerous military tech can be in the wrong hands. And in this movie, Batman does not give this weapon to the cops. He destroys it by the end of the movie. So Dent shows up suddenly in the backseat of Maroney's car. And I love, love, love how Nolan includes some subtle blocking to justify how he's able to get there. In this shot on the far left, right before the frame passes it, Maroney's guy gets hit in the back and grabbed by Harvey. And you can actually see Harvey entering the backseat in the side view mirror of the car, right as Maroney looks at his watch at this exact moment, explaining why he wouldn't be able to see Harvey. I'm almost certain that all of us, the first time we watch this movie, did not notice this. Nolan didn't expect us to, but he put this in there for the rewatch. And another new detail that I just noticed, Two-Face, as this deck's second Joker, echoes words the Joker said in the first act of the movie, but in reverse order. Half. Half. Your driver. The bus driver. So the movie's third act sets up the two fairies of the Joker's final game, one with normal citizens, one with convicts, and the Joker tells each of them that the detonators are for the other boat. So this social experiment finale turns the Dark Knight into kind of an interesting morality play, kind of like the movie and play 12 Angry Men. Batman and the Joker have made their cases for the just way for society to behave, and now it's really up to the two jury pools to test who made the best case, the White Knight mindset versus the Dark Knight mindset. Now in game theory, this is called the prisoner's dilemma, in which two prisoners are kept apart from each other and pressure by investigators to betray their partner. If the prisoners betray each other, they both go to jail for the longest sentence. If only one betrays the other, the one who betrays the other goes free, but the other is really screwed. But if both prisoners stay quiet, they do less time. And the Joker's assumption is that because he grouped a couple hundred people on each boat, as opposed to say just a dozen people who could deliberate calmly like a jury, that mob frenzy will inevitably prevail on both boats. Sending them after Coleman Reese was really a test for this very experiment. But we get to see two different ways that societies can respond to these crises. The average citizens hold a vote. And just that act of taking the time to slowly think it over, slowly put their names in a helmet, that calms them down a bit to realize that, hey, in this time, we are still here. Which is really Nolan's way of saying, hey, maybe slow moving democracy can actually be a good thing. Meanwhile, among the convicts, they essentially act out Harvey Dent's historical example earlier in the movie, suspending democracy and letting one man take the burden of defending the society. In this case, the Julius Caesar is the this one criminal who ends up being that hero that is both deserved and needed right now. Give it to me, and I'll do what you should have did 10 minutes ago. And I love that both forms of decision making have their merits. And I like how Nolan ultimately leans more toward one man making the right decision first. As the former Two Face Tommy Lee Jones says in Men in Black The person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. So I think really it's a testament to the good work that's already been done in Gotham to inspire the citizenry to be more heroic, even among some of the criminals that Dent put away. That the Joker's game is just not a game that these people want to play. It's like they've all seen the movie War Games. The only winning move is not to play. Meanwhile, the Joker from the Pruitt building, his eyes dart from side to side, little smirks of anticipation twitching on his face. But his bluff has been called. Humiliation has now set in. This is the weakest we've ever seen the Joker in the movie. His greatest power until now has been a shifting backstory about his scars, and that's what he defaults to here, but Batman doesn't let him get it out. Speaking of which, you know how I got these scars? No, but I know how you got me. <laughs> So the Joker hangs upside down now, and you can see a new fresh scar added to his right cheek. Batman turned his Glasgow smile into more of a Gotham frown, but Nolan slowly turns the camera so that it makes the Joker look right side up for this final scene, showing how the Joker has already inverted Gotham to his perverted worldview through one final ace in the hole, his releasing of an insane madman in the form of Harvey Dent. Joker's final line in the movie is pretty chilling. Madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. 
So yes, the Joker's philosophy is that all human beings, through our fear, will inevitably descend into a gravitational pull toward madness, and that all it takes is one bad day to send us spiraling. But while yes, sometimes all it can take is a little push, all you really need after that push is someone reaching out. So yes, while Batman does give a pretty big push to Harvey Dent at 250 52nd Street, he doesn't let the Joker fall to his death. He reaches out. Even the Joker, Batman is committed to proving wrong, that we are not all destined to fall into madness, and that all of us can be reached out to and kept from falling into that despair. So the movie's final scene circles back to the three-headed debate among the city leaders, Batman, Harvey Dent, and Jim Gordon. And while Batman didn't allow Joker one final scar story, he doesn't allow Two-Face one final coin flip. Though, for Harvey, it does land on heads. Gordon says, Thank you. You don't have to thank me. Yes, I do. Which is a callback to the ending of Batman Begins. I never said thank you. And you'll never have to. They choose to lie, to cover up Harvey Dent's killing spree by blaming it on the Batman. As Batman says, sometimes the truth isn't good enough, and sometimes people deserve to have their faith rewarded. As Batman runs off, Harvey's son calls after him. Batman! Batman! Yes, it echoes the little toehead calling out to the gunslinger at the end of 1953's Shane. Yeah! one of the most famous cinematic endings. But rather than seeing the literal death of the man, we are seeing the death of the hero's reputation as he lives long enough to see him become the villain. Gordon explains, Because it's the hero Gotham deserves, but not the one it needs right now. Gotham City deserves a selfless scapegoat willing to swallow their sins, but right now, it needs a beacon of hope, a martyred public servant, someone to inspire them so that they themselves can feel like the heroes in their everyday lives. Batman can't do that, Harvey Dent could. Because as we watch this movie, we don't really know what it feels like to be the Batman, but we do know what it feels like to make difficult choices in our everyday lives. And it's interesting how Gordon and Batman ensure the Joker doesn't win by playing his game. They lie. They invent a new narrative about how Harvey Dent got those scars. And while it's not fair, it is just to let the public believe a lie if it does less harm than if they knew the truth. A defense of lying is not a cozy value to end a movie with, but it is what makes The Dark Knight the best Batman film. In journalism school, I was taught that truth is paramount, but also another interesting value that every young journalist is taught is almost as important. Afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And it's just a tough truth that any adult who's had to take the high road at some point in their lives understands. To comfort the afflicted sometimes just means to afflict one's own comfort. Uphold the lie, take the heat, and keep doing the work. That's why this uncomfortable ending still hits so strong for so many viewers, because we've all been through that at some point in our lives, and it sucks, but we get it. And so Batman takes a literal high road in the final frames of this movie. The Dark Knight. And Nolan did something cool in this final shot that I just realized. Batman's cape and his cowl block the sunrise. But in the final frame of the movie, literally one frame before we cut to black, Nolan allows the daylight to hit the lens and create a lens flare. The final frame of this movie manifests Harvey's quote, the night is darkest just before the dawn. And so it leaves us with hope that we can resist the gravitational black holes of madness by taking a selfless high road and that there is light at the end of that tunnel. I am amazed how many new angles I was able to find in this masterpiece of a film. What's something new you discovered upon your most recent rewatch of The Dark Knight? Subscribe to The Deep Dive and share this channel and its videos with everyone you know. Follow me at EA Voss, and I'll see you next time, my silent guardians, my watchful protectors, my divers of the deep.